This is W. Clement Stone with a question for you. The question is, can there really be a system for success? Today, right at this moment, in every part of the world, there are those who wonder what they can do to get further along towards some shining goal and to their own self-improvement. Many will snatch a secret from the depths of their hearts and souls that will drive them on to high achievement. But most of them will continue to wonder, dream, and wish. And then one day, they will awaken with a shock to find themselves standing in the same spot at which they dreamed as young men. But now, they have lost their dream, and they wonder why. Everyone wants something, no matter what it is. Money, position, prestige, some special achievement, the opportunity to be of service to his fellow men, love, a happy marriage, and a happy home. Everyone yearns for some kind of fulfillment, success in some form, to be happy, to be healthy, to be wealthy, and to experience the true riches of life. These are universal desires, and it's these inner urges which inspire us to action. You and I are no exception, and you have the same opportunities as other men and women in high or low places to succeed or to fail in this land of unlimited opportunity where many have brought their good desires into reality and where others have fallen into the wayside of life. Why does one man succeed and another fail? There is an answer, and it will be found in this magic cassette. For there are formulas, prescriptions, recipes, rules, principles, systems, even treasure maps, if you please, which when followed in proper sequence, bring the good things in life to those who seek them. Often the rules for success are so simple and so obvious, they aren't even seen. But when you search for them, you too can find them. And during the search, something wonderful happens. You acquire knowledge. You gain experience. You become inspired. And then you begin to recognize the necessary ingredients for success. Several years ago, I accepted an invitation to visit Kentuckiana Children's Center at Louisville, Kentucky. I heard that Dr. Lorraine Golden, its directress, had given up a large income from her private practice to use her talents, experience, and the help of a higher power to help crippled children walk. As I toured the clinic, I noticed everything was spotlessly clean. I stopped when I saw a little girl seated in a chair. What's your name? I asked gently. Jenny, she replied. The girl's mother was seated nearby, so I asked her to tell me about Jenny. The mother's eyes looked into mine as she said, Jenny is six years of age. For the first four years of her life, she was a cripple, unable to walk. We didn't have money, so I brought her to the clinic. Dr. Golden told me that Jenny had a nerve blockage. Now Jenny can walk. The mother hesitated. From her expression, I felt she had something more to say, something personal. So I waited. Mr. Stone, I want you to know that she hesitated again. And then she said it. Outside my church, this is the only house in which I feel the presence of God. When she finished, her head was bowed as if to hide her emotions and perhaps a tear. Jenny, the little girl who couldn't walk for the first four years of her life, 
walked over to her mother, put her arms around her, and kissed her. And as I continued my tour through the clinic, I realized that it was a driving desire of Dr. Golden which had made Kentuckiana a reality. A generous, dedicated, self-sacrificing desire that could not be held down. But to move on to action, desire must be joined to ambition and initiative. How does one develop ambition when he isn't ambitious? How does he develop initiative when he doesn't have it? How do you motivate yourself or another person to action? These are the questions I've often been asked by persons in all walks of life. Parents, teachers, ministers, salesmen, sales managers, executives, and high school and college students. First, develop a desire, I respond. But how do you germinate a desire? How do you begin? These answers will become self-evident as you listen. Listen for the message that is applicable to you. Remember, there is magic in desire. Also magic lies in the skill of the magician. And skill depends upon three necessary ingredients. In fact, continuous success in each human activity always depends upon these three same important ingredients. This I learned, and this I proved, as I first developed my sales system that never failed, which later led me to an amazing discovery the success system that never failed. I've seen the principles of success at work in the lives of hundreds of men and women in every field of endeavor. It was only through continuous study and testing that I found the reasons behind both success and failure, and something more, how to motivate those who had failed later to succeed. In the belief that that which remains with you when you share with others the good and the beautiful, will multiply and grow, I am sharing with you, in this cassette, the techniques for success as I have found them to be. And I know from experience that if you will take a journey with me through this recording on a treasure hunt, you too will be able to use the success system that never fails to bring your worthwhile desires into reality. An old Hindu legend states that when the gods were making the world, they said, where can we hide the most valuable of treasures so they will not be lost? How can we hide them so that the lust and greed of men will not steal or destroy them? What can we do to be assured that these riches will be carried on from generation to generation for the benefit of all mankind? So in their wisdom, they selected a hiding place that was so obvious it wouldn't be seen. And there they placed the true riches of life, endowed with the magic power of perpetual self-replenishment. In this hiding place, these treasures can be found by every living person in every land who follows the success system that never fails. And as you listen to my voice, listen as if I were your personal friend talking to you and you alone. For this magic cassette is dedicated to you and all who seek the true riches of life. I was six years old and scared. Selling newspapers on Chicago's tough south side wasn't easy, especially with the older kids taking over the busy corners, yelling louder and threatening me with clenched fists. The memory of those dim days is still with me, for it's the first time I can recall turning a disadvantage into an advantage. It's a simple story, unimportant now, and yet it was a beginning. Hallie's restaurant was near the corner where I tried to work, and it gave me an idea. It was a busy and prosperous place that presented a frightening aspect to a child of six. I was nervous. But I walked in hurriedly 
and made a lucky sale at the first table. Then diners at the second and third table bought papers too. When I started for the fourth, however, Mr. Halley pushed me out the front door. But I had sold three papers, so when Mr. Halley wasn't looking, I walked back in and called at the fourth table. Apparently, the jovial customer liked my gumption. He paid for the paper, gave me an extra dime before Mr. Halley pushed me out once again. But I had already sold four papers and got a bonus dime besides. I walked into the restaurant and started selling again. There was a lot of laughter. The customers were enjoying the show. One whispered loudly, Let him be, as Mr. Halley came toward me. About five minutes later, I sold all my papers. The next evening, I went back. Mr. Halley again ushered me out the front door. But when I walked right back in, he threw his hands in the air and exclaimed, What's the use? Later we became great friends, and I never had trouble selling papers there again. Years later, I used to think of that little boy, almost as if he were not I, but some strange friend from long ago. Once after I'd made my fortune, was head of a large insurance empire, I analyzed that boy's actions in the light of what I had learned. This is what I concluded. One, he needed the money. Newspapers would be worthless to him if they weren't sold. He couldn't even read them. The few pennies he had borrowed to buy them would also be lost. To a six-year-old, this catastrophe was enough to motivate him to make him keep trying. Thus, he had the necessary inspiration to action. Two, after his first success in selling three papers in the restaurant, he went back in, even though he knew he might be embarrassed and thrown out again. After three trips in and out, he had the necessary technique for selling papers in restaurants. Thus, he gained the know-how. Three, he knew what to say because he had heard the older kids yelling out the headline. All he had to do when he approached a prospective customer was to repeat, in a softer voice, what he had heard. Thus he possessed the requisite activity knowledge. I smiled as I realized that my little friend had become successful as a newsboy by using the same techniques that later flowered into a system for success that enabled him and others to amass fortunes. But I'm getting ahead of myself. For now, just remember those three phrases. Inspiration to action. Know-how and activity knowledge. They are the keys to the system. Memorize them. Even though I was raised in a poor rundown neighborhood, I was happy. Aren't all children happy regardless of poverty, if they have a place to sleep, something to eat, and room to play? I lived with my mother in the home of relatives. As I grew older, the grandfather of a girl who lived on the top floor of our apartment building sparkled my imagination with stories of cowboys and Indians while we ate puff rice and milk. And each day, when he tired of his storytelling, I'd go downstairs in the backyard and live the part of Buffalo Bill, our great Indian warrior chief. My pony, made out of a stick or an old broom, was the fastest in the West. Picture a working mother seeing her young son in bed at night and asking him to tell about his day's experience. Those that were good, those that were bad. Picture him, after they had talked for a while, getting out of bed and kneeling beside his mother while she prayed for guidance. Then you have the feeling of the beginning of my search for the true riches of life. Mother had a lot to pray for. Like all good mothers, she felt that her son was a good boy. But she was concerned because he was keeping bad company. And she was particularly disturbed 
that he developed the habit of smoking cigarettes. Tobacco was costly. So I used to roll coffee grounds and cigarette paper when tobacco was not available. Perhaps it made me feel important. For another boy and I smoked only when other boys and girls were around, taking particular pleasure if they seemed shocked. When we had company at home, I would demonstrate how grown up I was by smoking a homemade cigarette. A pattern was being established. But it wasn't good. Like other kids who get started in the wrong direction, I played hooky. I didn't have any fun doing it. I felt guilty. Perhaps that was the way I tried to show that I was different from the other boys in my group. But there was one good thing I did do. At night, when my mother and I would talk, I would tell her the truth, and I would tell her everything. My mother's prayers for guidance were answered. She enrolled me in Spalding Institute, a parochial boarding school at Nauvoo, Illinois. There, through exposure to a wholesome environment, in which the three ingredients of the success system that never fails were employed, something happened. Something good. Where can one develop inspiration to action, to search for self-improvement, better than in a religious school? And who has greater know-how and the necessary knowledge to teach character than those who are devoting their entire lives to the church, striving to purify their own souls while trying to save the souls of others? As the weeks passed in the months, the months into years, I developed a secret ambition to be like my religious father, the pastor whom I admired and loved. But I also love my mother, and I missed her very much. Like so many boys living away from home at private school, I was homesick. And like them, every time I saw my mother or wrote to her, I would beg her to bring me home permanently. After two years at Nauvoo, she felt I was ready. Equally important, she was ready. Or perhaps it was motherly love for she too longed to have me with her. Although there was some question of my ability to adjust to a new environment, she knew that she could always send me back to Nauvoo if it became desirable. I was ready, and she was too. Early in life, Mother had learned to sew, and because she had initiative, talent, and sensitivity, she became proficient at it. Shortly after I left for Nauvoo, she realized that a change of home and business environment was desirable for her. She was now in a position to do something about it, for she didn't have to be concerned with arranging for someone to care for me while she was at work. She obtained a position in a very exclusive ladies' import establishment known as Dillon. Within two years, she was in complete charge of all designing, fitting, and sewing, and she had developed a reputation among the exclusive clientele of being an outstanding designer and dressmaker. Her earnings were sufficiently great to enable her to get her own apartment in a nicer neighborhood. Within a block of our apartment was a rooming house where the landlady did her own home cooking, and I had my meals there. The food was wonderful. Beef stew, baked beans, homemade pies, mashed potatoes and gravy, notwithstanding the jovial complaints of the adult boarders, who were the most interesting people in the world to an 11-year-old boy. Show people. They liked me, too. I was the only child there. Like thousands of men and women who grasp the opportunity to make the upward climb in this land of unlimited opportunity, Mother saved enough money to establish her own business. Her reputation as a designer and dressmaker brought good clients, but she lacked the know-how to utilize bank credit. Many small businesses would become big business if the owners only learn that banks are in the business to help small businesses become large through sound financing. Because of lack of working capital or the proper utilization of bank credit, Mother's dressmaking business never expanded beyond her personal work and that of two full-time employees. 
Like most persons who endeavor to establish their own business, she too had her financial problems. But these problems brought to us many of the true riches of life, such as the joy of giving. I made my spending money, which was partly savings money, for I had established a savings account, by building a Saturday evening post and newspaper out. Although each night Mother asked me to tell her about my problems, she never bothered to tell me about her own. But I could sense them. One morning I noticed that she seemed to be quite worried. Later that day, before she returned home, I drew out what was to me a big chunk of my savings and purchased a dozen of the best roses I could buy. My mother's joy at this token of love inspired me to realize the true joy of the giver. Often over the years, she would tell her friends with a mother's pride about the dozen beautiful long stem roses and what they had done for her. This experience made me realize that money was a good thing to have for the good it could do. January 6th was always an important day in my mother's life and mine, for that was her birthday, one January 6th. When for some reason, perhaps because of Christmas shopping, my bank account was down to less than a dollar, I was very much concerned, for I wanted desperately to buy her a birthday gift. That morning, I prayed for guidance. At the lunch hour, while walking home from school, my ears were tuned to the cracking of the ice beneath my feet. Suddenly, I stopped and turned around. Something told me to go back and take a look. I walked back picked up a crumpled green paper, and was amazed to find a $10 bill. That's something you'll hear more about. I was excited, but I decided not to buy a gift after all. I had a better plan. Mother was home for lunch. As she was clearing the table, she picked up her plate and found a handwritten birthday note and the $10 bill. Once again, I found the joy of the giver, for it seemed that this was a day when everyone else had forgotten her birthday. She was delighted with this gift, which at the time seemed to her quite a sum. These personal experiences will indicate that each new decision that a child or an adult makes in a given set of circumstances begins patterns of thought that later create a tremendous impact in his life. When an adult makes a decision, it is likely to be foolish or sound, depending on his past experiences in coming to decision. For the little things that are good ripen into big things that are good, and the little things that are bad ripen into big things that are bad, and this applies to decision. But good decisions must be followed through with action. Without action, a good decision becomes meaningless. For the desire itself can die through lack of an attempt to achieve its fulfillment. That's why you should act immediately on a good decision. I was 12 years of age when an older neighbor boy, whom I respected, invited me to attend a Boy Scout meeting. I went and had a lot of fun, so I joined his troop, Troop 23, under a scoutmaster named Stuart P. Walsh who was attending the University of Chicago. I'll never forget him. He was a man of character. He wanted every boy in his troop to become a first-class scout within a short space of time, and he inspired each boy to want his troop to be the best in the city of Chicago. Perhaps that's one reason why it was. Another was his firm conviction. To get what you expect, inspect, when you teach, inspire, train, and supervise others. Every scout in Troop 23 made a weekly report of the good turns he had done each day in the week, the ways he had helped someone else without receiving compensation of any kind. This made each boy look for the opportunity to do a good deed, and because he looked, he found the opportunity. Stuart P. Walsh imprinted in the memory of each member of Troop 23 an indelible pattern, the principles of the scout law. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, 
friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. But more important, he inspected to see if each scout and his troop knew how to relate, assimilate, and use each of these principles. Not to memorize them like a parrot, but to use them like a man. I can hear him say now, when you go after something, don't come back until you get it. This principle taught by an old scoutmaster became so ingrained in me that it formed, at first without my realizing it, another step on the road to the success system that never failed. One of the most important lessons of my life forced itself on me at about the time I was graduating from grammar school. It was a lesson that turned into a major principle. You are the subject of your environment. Therefore, select the environment that will best develop you toward your desired objective. Although I was not then able to state the thought as clearly as that, I was aware of the principle behind it. When it came time for me to enter high school, I concluded that Sun High was a better school than Lakeview High, which I would have to enter if we continued to live in the neighborhood in which we had our apartment at that time. Because an important change that my mother was making in business required that she move to Detroit, we made arrangements with a fine English family in the Sun District for me to live in their home. I also decided that I would select my own friends and going to the new school. In choosing, I searched for individuals of character and intelligence. And because I searched, I found what I was looking for, fine, wonderful persons who had a tremendous influence for good upon me. With me in a good home environment and attending a fine public school, Mother made an investment in a small insurance agency representing the United States Casualty Company in Detroit, Michigan. I'll never forget it. She pawned two diamonds to get sufficient cash to add to the money she did have to buy the agency. Remember, she hadn't learned to use bank credit in establishing a business. After running desk space in the downtown office building, she looked with anticipation to her first day's sale. That day she was lucky. She worked hard, but she didn't make a single sale, and that was good. For every adversity carries with it the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. What do you do when everything goes wrong? What do you do when there's no place to turn? What do you do when you are faced with a serious problem? Here's what she did the way she later told it to me. I was desperate. I'd invested all the cash I had, and I just had to get my money's worth out of this investment. I had tried my best, but I hadn't made a sale. That night, I prayed for guidance. And the next morning, I prayed for guidance. When I had left home, I went to the largest bank in the city of Detroit. There I sold a policy to the cashier, got permission to sell in the bank during working hours. It seemed that within me there was a driving force that was so sincere that all obstacles were removed. That day I made 44 sales. Through trial and error the first day, my mother developed inspirational dissatisfaction. She was inspired to action. She knew whom to ask for guidance and help in her efforts to make a livelihood, just as she knew whom to ask for guidance and help when she was faced with a problem regarding her son. And through trial and success the second day, she acquired know-how in selling her Axum policies that developed for her a successful sales system. Now she had know-how in addition to inspiration to action and activity knowledge. So the upward climb was rapid. Salesmen, like other persons, often fail in the upward climb because they do not reduce to a formula 
the principles applied on those days when they are successful. They know the facts, but they fail to extract the principles. Now that she was earning a good income in personal sales, my mother began to build a sales organization that operated throughout the state of Michigan under the trade name of Liberty Registry Company. Mother and I would see each other on holidays and during vacation periods. My second high school summer vacation was spent in Detroit. That's when I, too, learned to sell accident insurance, and that's when I started to search for a sales system for myself, a system that would never fail. The Liberty Registry Company office was in the old Free Press building. I spent a day in the office reading and studying the policy I was to try to sell the next day. My sales instructions were as follows. One, completely canvas the dime bank building. Two, start at the top floor and call on each and every office. Three, avoid calling in the office of the building. Four, use the introduction. May I take a moment of your time? Five, try to sell everyone you call up. So I followed instructions. Remember, I had learned as a Boy Scout, when you set out to do something, don't come back until you've done it. Was I frightened? You bet I was. But it never occurred to me not to follow instructions. I just didn't know any better. I was, in this respect, a product of habit. A good habit. The first day I sold two policies, two more than I'd ever sold before. The second day, four, and that was a 100% increase. The third day, six, a 50% increase. And the fourth day, I learned an important lesson. I called at a large real estate office, and when I stood at the desk of the sales manager and used the introduction, may I take a moment of your time, I was startled, for he jumped to his feet, pounded his desk with his right fist, and almost shouted, Boy, as long as you live, never ask a man for his time. Take it. So I took his time and sold him and 26 of his salesmen that day. That started me thinking. There must be a scientific way to sell many policies every day. There must be a method that will make one hour produce the work of many. Why not find a system for selling twice as much in half the time? Why can't I develop a formula that will bring maximum results for each hour of effort? From that point on, I was consciously trying to discover the principles that have since built for me my sales system that never fails. I reason. Success can be reduced to a formula, and failure can be reduced to a formula. Apply the one and avoid the other. Think for yourself. Regardless of who you are, it is desirable to learn the techniques of good salesmanship. For selling is merely persuading another person to accept your service, your product, or your idea. In a sense, everyone is a salesman. Whether or not you are a salesman by vocation, the minute details of my selling system are not really important to you, but the principles may be, if you are ready. What is important to you is that you reduce to a formula, preferably in writing, the principles you learn from your successful experiences and your failures in whatever activities you may be interested. But you may not know how to extract principles from what you read, hear, or experience. I'll illustrate how I did it. But you must think for yourself. Before I describe how I overcame timidity and fear when opening up closed doors, entering plush offices, and trying to sell businessmen and women as a teenager, let me first tell you how I faced the same problems as a boy. Many persons find it difficult to believe that as a youngster I was timid and afraid. But it is nature's law that with every new experience and in every new environment, an individual will feel some degree of fear. Nature protects the individual from danger by this awareness. Children and women experience this to a greater degree than men. Again, 
This is nature's way of protecting them from harm. I remember that as a boy I was so timid that when we had company I'd go into another room, and during a thunderstorm I would hide under the bed. One day I reasoned, if lightning is going to strike, it'll be just as dangerous whether I'm under the bed or in a, any other part of the room. I decided to conquer this fear. My opportunity came, and I took advantage of it. During a thunderstorm, I forced myself to go to the window and look at the lightning. An amazing thing happened. I began to enjoy the beauty of the flashes of lightning through the sky. Today, there is no one who enjoys a thunderstorm more than I do. Although I called in each office in sequence in the Dime Bank building, I had not looked the fear of opening a door particularly when I couldn't see what was on the other side. Many of the glass doors were frosted or had curtains on the inside. It was necessary to develop a method of forcing myself to enter. Then, because I searched, I found the answer. I reasoned. Success is achieved by those who try. Where there is nothing to lose by trying, and a great deal of gain of successful, by all means try. The repetition of either of these self-motivators satisfied my reason. But I was still afraid, and it was still necessary to get into action. Fortunately, I struck upon the self-starter. Do it now. Because I had learned the value of trying to establish the right habits and the harm of acquiring wrong habits, it occurred to me that I could force myself to action as I left one office if I would rush quickly into the next one. Should it occur to me to hesitate, I would use the self-starter, do it now, and immediately act on it. This I did. When once inside a place of business, I was still not at ease, but I soon learned how to neutralize the fear of talking to a stranger. I did it through voice control. I found that if I spoke loudly and rapidly, hesitated where there would be a period, comma, or other punctuation if the spoken word were in writing, kept a smile in my voice, and used modulation, I no longer had butterflies in my stomach. Later I learned that this technique was based on a very sound psychological principle. The emotions like fear are not always immediately subject to reason, but they are always subject to action. When thoughts do not neutralize an undesirable emotion, action will. The sales manager in the real estate office hadn't liked the introduction, may I take a moment of your time, besides, Many persons on whom I had used this introduction had answered no, so I abandoned it, and after experimenting, came up with a new one that I've used ever since. I believe this will interest you also. No one has ever said no to this introduction. Many have asked, what is it? Then, of course, I've told them and given them my sales talk. The purpose of a sales introduction is solely to get a person to listen. Know when to quit. Try to sell everyone you call on was one of the instructions my mother had given me, so I stayed with every prospect. Sometimes I wore him out, but when I left his place of business, I was worn out too. It seemed to me that in selling a low-cost service as I was doing, it was imperative that I average more sales per hour of effort. For it wasn't every day that I sold 27 policies in one place of business. So I decided not to sell everyone I called on. If the sale would take longer than a time limit, I had set for myself. I tried to make the prospect happy and leave hurriedly, even though I knew that if I stayed with him, I could make the sale. Wonderful things happened. I increased my average number of sales per day tremendously. What's more, the prospect, in several instances, thought I was going to argue. But when I left him so pleasantly, he would come next door to where I was selling and say, You can't do that to me. Every other insurance man would hang on. You come back and write it. Instead of being tired out after an attempted sale, I experienced enthusiasm 
and energy for my presentation to the next prospect. The principles I learned are simple. Fatigue is not conducive to doing your best work. Don't reduce your energy level so low that you drain your battery. The activity level of the nervous system is raised when the body recharges itself with rest. Time is one of the most important ingredients in any successful formula for any human activity. Save time. Invest it wisely. When you are talking to a person, look at his eyes. I was taught as a youngster. But in selling, I would look at a person's eyes and they would often shake his head no. And more often, he would interrupt me. I didn't like this. It slowed me down. Soon, I hit on a simple technique to avoid this. Get the prospect to concentrate through his senses of sight and hearing on what I had to show him and on what I had to say. I pointed to the policy or sales literature and looked at it as I gave my sales talk. Because I looked where I was pointing, he looked too. If out of the corner of my eye, I saw a prospect shake his head no, I paid no attention. Often, he would become interested, and I would later close the sale. In a highly competitive game or sport, you play according to the rules, and you don't violate the standards that you have set for yourself, but you play to win. So it is in the game of selling. For selling, like every other activity, becomes a lot of fun when you become an expert. I found that to become an expert, I had to work and work hard. Try, 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 and keep trying is the rule that must be followed to become an expert in anything. But in due course, by employing the right work habits, you do become an expert. Then you experience the joy of work. And the job is no longer work. It becomes fun. Day after day, I worked and worked hard, trying to improve my sales techniques. I searched for trigger words, words and phrases that would set off the right reaction within the prospect. And the right reaction meant that he would buy within a reasonable short space of time. For time meant money to me. I wanted to say the right thing in the right way to get the right reaction. This took practice, and practice is work. Everything has a beginning and an ending. The introduction is the beginning of a sales presentation. How could I end the sale in the shortest space of time in a manner that would make the prospect happy? Because I searched, I made a discovery. If you want the prospect to buy, ask him to buy. Just ask him and give him a chance to say yes. But make it easy for him to say yes, and difficult to say no. Specifically, use force with such finesse that it is subtle, pleasing, and effective. And here's what I found. If you want a person to say yes, just make a positive statement and ask an affirmative question. Then the yes answer is almost a natural reflex action. Examples. One, positive statement. It's a nice day. Affirmative question, isn't it? Answer, yes it is. Two, mother who wants a child to practice the piano for an hour on a Saturday morning when she knows that the child wants to go out to play. She could say, positive statement, you want to practice for an hour now so that you'll have the entire day to play. Affirmative question. Isn't that true? Answer yes. Three. A sales lady offering the customer a lace handkerchief could say, positive statement, this is beautiful and it's quite reasonable. Affirmative question. Don't you think so? Answer yes. Affirmative question. May I gift wrap it for you then? Answer yes. The effective close I found is just a simple positive statement. So if you don't mind, I'd like to write it for you also if I may. Affirmative question. May I? Answer yes. The stories of my experiences in the dying bank building indicate the techniques I use to begin to develop my sales system that never fails. 
and why I use them. I was searching for the necessary knowledge for each step that would comprise the entire sales presentation. I was endeavoring to acquire the know-how, the experience of using this specific knowledge through repeated action. In brief, I was preparing myself to develop the habit of using a formula that would consistently obtain outstanding results in sales for me in the shortest possible space of time. Although I didn't realize it then, I was, in reality, getting ready for tomorrow. For some years later, I discovered that my sales system employed principles that are the common denominator of continuous successful achievement in every human activity. And thus I made a greater discovery, the success system that never fails. What does it mean to you? Health, happiness, success, and wealth can be yours when you understand and employ the success system that never fails. For the system works if you work the system. As you search for the success system that never fails, you will make faster and more permanent progress by keeping in mind the three necessary ingredients, which are in order of their importance. One, inspiration to action. That which motivates you or anyone else to act because you want to. Two, know-how. The particular techniques and skills that consistently get results for you. Know-how is the proper application of knowledge. Know-how becomes habit through actual repetitive experience. 3. Activity knowledge. Knowledge of the activity, service, product, methods, techniques and skills with which you are particularly concerned. It takes less work to succeed than to fail. The use of energy is work. When you or I engage in any activity whatsoever, energy is used. To concentrate your energy on a given task, focus your attention on it, and don't waste your efforts needlessly. Simple as this may seem, that's how you acquire activity knowledge, know-how, and inspiration to action. And that's how I develop my success system that never fails. When you do something, put your heart into it. Give it everything you've got. Then relax. Concentrated attention and effort, then relaxing, became a habit with me shortly after I started to sell accident insurance. First, I'd get a good night's sleep, selling door-to-door -door in stores and offices, and desk-to-desk -desk in banks and other large institutions, used up physical energy. And as a young man, I needed lots of sleep. Next, I made it a practice to make my first business call at a specific time, nine in the morning. But before making that call, I would condition my mind. I would concentrate. And I would ask for divine guidance and help. I would allow nothing to disturb me. I'd get keyed up. Then I'd move fast every working hour of the day. I tried to make every minute count. At noon, I'd relax with a light lunch and start all over again. If I were working in a city away from home, I'd go back to my hotel, have lunch, sleep for half an hour, and then figuratively start a new day. When I was through working at 5 or 5.30, I was through working. I'd relax and got my mind off selling. By concentrating my efforts on the sale of just one accent policy, I learned almost all there was to know about that one policy, and I learned from experience what to say and how to say it, what to do and how to do it, to sell in tremendous volume. I gained activity knowledge and know-how. I learned how to develop inspiration to action at will. In a sense, like a scientist, I learned from trial and error, trial and success, for I firmly believed that I could develop a memorized sales talk and an organized sales plan that would make sale after sale a possibility. In another sense, like an actor, 
I could put feeling, emotion, and timing into my memorized talk. When you go to the theater and see a great actor, it never occurs to you that someone else wrote those lines. You may not realize that his actions as well as his words are the same at every performance. For he lives the part. I not only live the part when selling, but also develop the script. And like a good playwright, I improved it at every opportunity. Unlike the playwright, I changed the sales talk to meet changing conditions. But what was said became standardized for such occasions. Thus, if I were interrupted in the beginning of the presentation, I would use one of my standard jokes to relieve tension, rather than give the joke later in the talk as I had originally intended. Work? Yes, it was work. And I had many battles to win over myself. And that was work, too. But that was good, for I searched for techniques to control my feelings and emotions. There were times when I used to wonder whether I would ever overcome the fear of calling on the owner or president of a large bank or department store. But I found that conditioning my mind, using self-motivators, and the simple technique of keeping on trying helped me. The day eventually did come when I could call on the head of a large institution in New York, Chicago, or elsewhere without a feeling of fear, for I had become the product of habit. Like the scientist who finally discovers the success formula for which he is searching, and the actor who lives his part, I found that by doing the same thing the same way, I developed consistent results. And like the scientist, I found that time was an important ingredient in every formula. Nothing stands still. There is constant change from within and from without. If you should concentrate the rays of the sun through a magnifying glass on one spot on a fallen log, you'd start a fire within a few minutes. Yet the sun could shine for decades on the same piece of wood, and it wouldn't ignite without the glass. In time, under ordinary circumstances, it would merely decompose and become part of the earth, similarly with you and me. It takes time to succeed. It takes time to fail. But it takes less time to succeed than to fail. We can clearly understand this when we consider continuous success, an entire career, the span of a life. For it takes less time to succeed when you do the right thing rather than the wrong, when you work the right way with the proper knowledge, effective techniques, and inspiration to action. For then you have a success system. You may work the wrong way or do the wrong thing and temporarily succeed by accident or by virtue of the conditions at the time. You may even stumble on the right system and momentarily succeed and then lose the system and fail because you don't reduce the principles of your temporary success to a formula. It takes less work to succeed than to fail. It's quite common for a company or a person to succeed for a time and then fail. Let's take a specific example with which I am familiar. Since 1900, when insurance man Harry Gilbert made a trip to England and found that insurance companies there were selling what they term coupon contract accident policies, Many American insurance companies have sold similar policies. We call them pre-issue accident policies, for they are written and delivered by the salesman at the actual time of sale. These were sold on a cold canvas basis. Cold canvassing, as you know, is making unannounced calls on persons you don't know to sell them something. Many agencies for these companies were outstandingly successful for a period of years. Today, however, Every agency and every company that handled pre-issue accident policies has discontinued the selling plan or has gone out of business, with but one exception. Why? The business was unprofitable. They lost money. They either didn't develop a success system, or if they did, they lost it. The one exception? The companies I manage. Again, why? I developed a sales system that never failed. And with it, I was able to sell more policies in a week than salesmen without a system sold in months. There was one reason. I saved time. 
That is why I succeeded in the long run and others failed. My efforts were concentrated on one policy, and my attention was focused on its sale. I saved time. I tried to make one hour do the work of many, just as I tried to make one dollar do the work of many. Often I thought, if I have to work, I might as well try to earn in one year what others earn in a lifetime. But I realized that this could only be done by operating on the basis of a success system that never fails. I eventually achieved many worthwhile objectives, including the one regarding annual earnings. And the basic principles I applied to reach my targets in every instance were, one, inspiration to action, to be achieved at will, two, know-how, to be gained through experience, three, activity knowledge. But how does one acquire activity knowledge? There are many ways. I learned all I needed to know to sell personal accident insurance and volume through experience. I learned by doing. In particular, I learned this principle. Do what you are afraid to do. Go where you are afraid to go. When you run away because you are afraid to do something big, you pass opportunity by. During the first few years of my selling career, I was exceedingly frightened when I approached the entrance of a bank, a railway office, department store, or other large institution. So I passed them by. I learned later that I had passed by doors leading to exceptional opportunity, for I found that it was easier to sell in those places than in smaller establishments where I had learned to neutralize my initial fears, and I eventually concluded that outstanding success in sales could be achieved in large institutions, because other salesmen were also, of course, with the right system, the no can be turned into a, a yes, but this often takes time. And besides, a big man, a successful man, a man who is built from the bottom up has a heart. He'll give you a break. He would try to help someone else on his way up. All this I learned. Here's why and how it happened that I first began to develop the habit of selling in large organizations. I was 19 at the time, and my mother sent me on a trip up to Flint, Saginaw, and Bay City, Michigan, to renew established business and to sell new prospects. Everything went fine at Flint. In Saginaw, I was in real selling trend. My daily sales were outstanding. Since we only had two renewals in Bay City, I wrote to ask my mother to send notices to them so I could continue working in Saginaw. Don't run away from good fortune or success has always seemed a wise motto to me. But my mother telephoned, gave me orders to leave Saginaw and go to Bay City. I didn't want to, but I went. Orders are orders. Perhaps it was rebelliousness, although I like to consider it righteous indignation. But when I reached my hotel in Bay City, I took the two renewal names and threw them in the upper right-hand dresser drawer. Then I went to the largest bank and interviewed the cashier, a man by the name of Reed. I didn't know it then, but he had just been made cashier. In the course of our conversation, he pulled out a metal identification tag and said, I've had your policy and key tag service for 15 years. I bought it originally when I was working in a bank in Ann Arbor. I was transferred here quite recently. I thanked Mr. Reed and asked for permission to speak to the others, which he granted. I let each prospect know that Mr. Reed said he had carried our service for 15 years and had granted me permission to speak to him. Results? Everyone bought. With this momentum, I kept on going from store to store, office to office. I call on banks, insurance offices, and other large institutions. I call on everyone. I just mowed them down. I averaged 48 policies per day for the two weeks I was in Bay City. And on the Saturday that I left, in fairness to our policyholders and the company, I opened the upper right-hand dresser drawer, took out the real names, and service them too. The principle came crystal clear to me. Do what you're afraid to do. 
go where you are afraid to go. When you run away because you are afraid to do something big, you pass opportunity by. I later realized that I'd passed opportunity by for many reasons other than fear. And although you must have experience to develop know-how, you can acquire activity knowledge if you are willing to learn from those who are willing to teach, and from the experience of others, and from books. I should have realized this before the age of 19. It seems so obvious to me now. Yet there are many teenagers who, like me at that time, drop out of high school. They have an argument with the teacher, or they don't have the right study and work habits, or they want to earn money, or they feel they're grown up, or perhaps resent regimented authority. But fortunately for me, I developed the desire and willingness to learn from those who were willing to teach and from books. And a willingness to learn can turn temporary failure into success in the long run. You've heard it said, uh, Mother is a wonderful cook. But she can never tell me exactly how she does it. It's just a pinch of this, a dash of that, she says. But her stews, meatloaf, and biscuits are sensational every time. Mother has know-how. What's the difference between knowledge and know-how? It's often the difference between success and failure. The word know-how does not mean knowing how to do something. That's activity knowledge. Know-how is doing that something the right way with skill and effectiveness and with a minimum expenditure of time and effort. I don't recall an instance where a legal problem with which I was faced was not decided favorably. During this time I was operating my own insurance agency and the know-how became invaluable to me and to the insurance companies I represented. To solve a problem or to reach a goal, you don't need to know all the answers in advance, but you must have a clear idea of the problem or the goal you want to reach. So begin to determine what you really want in the distant, intermediate, and near future. If you are not ready to set distant, and intermediate, specific, concrete goals be encouraged. It may be more beneficial at this time to decide what your general or abstract objectives should be. To have physical, mental, and moral health. To gain well. To be a person of character. To be a good citizen, father or mother, husband or wife, son or daughter. Whatever these general goals they must of necessity be immediate objectives as well. Everyone has immediate, specific aims or objectives. You know, for example, what you intend to do tomorrow, or what you would like to do next week, or perhaps next month. And it would be easy for you to write down specific immediate goals that will, when achieved, bring you closer to the health, wealth, happiness, or character you expect to acquire in the intermediate or distant future, but you must want to. Now, there are those who have knowledge and know-how, but they don't succeed. For although they know what to do and how to do it, they don't feel like doing it. They're not inspired to action. Inspiration to action is the most important ingredient to success in any human activity. And inspiration to action can be developed at will. When I was in the sixth grade, I decided I wanted to become a lawyer. That's why, when I entered high school, I was interested in such subjects as mathematics, to help me think logically, history, to help me understand the past and present and project into the future, English composition, to give me the opportunity to express my thoughts and philosophy, and psychology, to give me the understanding of the functioning of the human mind. I joined the debating club at San Hai, primarily to become an expert in argumentation. I later entered the Detroit College of Law, but I discontinued after a year because I decided that I wanted to get married when I was 21, and I knew that the girl I was to marry would be the most important influence for good in my life. That's true, of course, of everyone. 
A husband or wife is the greatest environmental influence for any man or woman. I dropped out of law school because I felt I couldn't make a large enough income as a lawyer until I was at least 35 years of age. It's unethical for a lawyer to solicit clients. But as a salesman, I could call on all the prospects I wanted to. My income would be contingent upon my ability and its application, and I knew I could sell. Moreover, I reasoned that it was possible to make and save enough money through selling to retire at the age of 30, go back to school, study law, and enter a legal and political career. Besides, I said to myself, I can then handle the law cases I want to handle, not those I have to. Jesse and I had met at Senhai. Our courtship and my love for her can be expressed by the words of Mary Carolyn Davies' song, Why I Love You. Why do I love you? I love you not only for what you are, but for what I am when I am with you. Not only for what you have made of yourself, but for what you are making of me. After two years at Sun High, I'd moved to Detroit and entered Northwestern High School. We corresponded often. Jesse and her mother would sometimes visit my mother and me, and I made several trips to Chicago. I concluded that it would be best to establish my own insurance agency in Chicago. My mother wrote to Harry Gilbert, who was the officer we did business with for the United States Casualty Company and the New Amsterdam Casualty Company. Mr. Gilbert responded that he would be pleased to have me represent the two companies in Illinois, but I would first have to get permission to make a home office connection from the general agent in Chicago, who already had an exclusive arrangement. I made arrangements to meet with the general agent. I just had to sell him. My whole program depended on his permission. But I was a salesman by vocation, and I knew from experience that if you want something, you have to go after it. The general agent was very courteous, and I'll never forget what he said. I'll give you permission, but you'll be out of business in six months. It's difficult to sell in Chicago. If you appoint agents, you'll have nothing but trouble, and you'll lose money. I'll always be grateful to him for not interfering with my opportunity. So in November 1922, I established my agency under the name of Combined Registry Company. My working capital was $100 but I was debt-free, and my overhead expense was low, since I rented desk space at $25 a month from Richard H. Pickering. Mr. Pickering was a real inspiration to me, and he was most helpful in giving good advice. For example, when it came to having my name on the lobby directory, he asked me, How do you want your name listed? C. Stone, I responded. At school, and up to that time, that was the way I signed my name. What are you ashamed of, he asked. What do you mean? Well, don't you have a first name and a second name? Yes, William Clementstone. Did you ever stop to consider that there are thousands of sea stones? But the chances are that in the entire United States, there is only one W. Clementstone. This appealed to my self-esteem. Only one W. Clement Stone, I thought. And ever since, that has been the way I signed my name. The wedding was set for June. I wanted to acquire as much cash as I could before then. So I didn't waste time. On my first day, I worked on North Clark Street in Rogers Park, within a few blocks of the place where I was staying. I made 54 sales that day. Then I knew that Chicago would be an easy place to sell it and that I would be in business for more than six months. I was motivated to work hard to establish my business and get the money I needed to marry the girl I love. This is understandable, for you may use reason to motivate yourself and appeal to reason to motivate others, but the inner urge of your feelings, emotions, instincts, and ingrained habits 
give you the go power that puts you into action. A good salesman has confidence in himself. He knows what he can do, and necessity often forces him to do it. While I was engaged in personal sales, my earnings were what many considered exceedingly high. Yet it seemed there was always a need for money. Payments on the car, payments on the furniture, payments on life insurance. Perhaps it was because I bought what I wanted, then had to work like blazes to pay for it. I'd leave home in the morning with very little cash, for I knew I'd have substantial sums by the end of the day. For example, the first time I worked Joliet, Illinois, I arrived at 8.30 in the morning with 10 cents in my pocket. That didn't bother me. On the contrary, it inspired me. I checked into the Woodruff Inn, then walked across the street, and had breakfast, a hot dog, and a glass of milk. There's been inflation since. Joliet was only 40 miles from my home, yet I took the train instead of driving, and stayed at a hotel instead of returning home each night. On the train I'd relax, for I had developed the ability to sleep anywhere, at any time, under almost any circumstances. So in a rail road coach, I just put my elbow on the windowsill, rest my head on my hand, and fall asleep. But I always did something more before falling asleep. I'd conditioned my mind. I prayed for guidance and help. Staying at a hotel instead of returning home each night gave me a minimum of ten hours sleep, for traveling time was saved. With the extra sleep, I'd be in peak condition. When I sold, I deliberately got keyed up and put everything I had into my sales presentation. Many salesmen have poor days because they are fatigued. Their batteries need recharging. They need rest. But when I called on my prospect, I was rested. Again, before I called on a prospect, I conditioned my mind. And when I made my sales presentation, my energies were concentrated on one thing only, the job at hand. To make the sale in the shortest possible space of time, in a manner that would clearly give the purchaser a concept of what he was buying and to sow seeds of thought so he would renew his policy year after year on the renewal date with little sales resistance. For I realized one way to make a fortune is to sell a necessity that is low in cost and repeats. The fortune is made in the repeat business. At Joliet, I made my greatest sales record up to that time, an average of 72 policies per day for nine working days. And it was the morning after that eventful day when I sold 122 policies that I resolved to begin to multiply myself to start building an organization. At the end of that day, I was happy but tired. I went to bed earlier than usual, and that night I sold policies in my sleep. The next morning I realized I had reached my peak in personal sales. At breakfast I reasoned. If I make 122 sales each day and then sell policies in my sleep, it won't be conducive to a healthy mind. Now is the time to build an organization. Now is the time to multiply myself. And when I completed the Joliet assignment, I fulfilled the promise I made to myself to start to hire salesmen immediately. When I did, an amazing thing happened. I encountered powers unknown to me. I raised my horizons. For I recognized a principle I could use. And when I did, I saw opportunity and grasped it. What I saw and what I did marked the beginning of a financial empire. It was very simple. I placed a four-line ad for salesmen in the classified ad section of the Chicago Sunday Tribune. I had inspiration to action, but I lacked know-how and knowledge in the skill of hiring. Nonetheless, after much thought, I constructed a four-line ad that has required very little change over a period of many, many years. It got results, at times fantastic results. Exceptional opportunity to earn was the lead line. The number of personal calls at my office as a result of the ad was more than satisfactory. 
But the amazing thing to me was the number of letters I received from applicants outside of Chicago. Downstate Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, and elsewhere. I hadn't realized the power of an advertisement in a Metropolitan Sunday newspaper to reach beyond the city limits. But I soon decided to grasp the opportunity. I saw the possibility of expanding beyond the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. So I immediately wrote to Harry Gilbert and indicated that I had a prospective salesman in Wisconsin and another in Indiana. Would it be all right to hire them, I asked. I felt it unwise to refer to more than two until I got one foot in the door. I sent the Michigan inquiries to my mother in Detroit. The five anxious days that I waited for a reply seemed mighty long. Before I received an answer, I hired two men for Chicago, wrote to those who had made inquiry from the rest of the state, and engaged in personal sales for four of the five days. I needed immediate income. On Saturday, the letter from Mr. Gilbert arrived. He was complimentary and encouraging, and he gave me permission to hire the applicants in Wisconsin and Indiana. Mr. Gilbert had no representatives in either state for this special policy department. So I wrote to these applicants. It never occurred to me to suggest a personal interview, and they accepted my offer. Then I reasoned, if Mr. Gilbert would allow me to hire one applicant in each state, he would allow me to hire more. This was an exceptional opportunity for me, and I decided to take it. In addition to continuing to advertise in the Chicago Tribune, I placed ads in the Milwaukee and Indianapolis Sunday papers. Result? More increase, more salesmen from these states, and increase from other states as well. Again, I wrote to Mr. Gilbert, and it was only a matter of time until I was hiring salesmen in every state where he did not have an agency for his department. For I realized that I had hit upon a success formula, and it paid to get the most out of it. I moved ahead quickly in building a sales organization through the mail. Yet I continued to sell personally, for I needed the income. My procedure was to answer letters early in the morning, sell them to five in the afternoon, then return to my office for an hour or so for any additional office work required. I preferred to work downtown Chicago, where I could then get in additional office time. Naturally, with the expansion of business, it became necessary for me to expand my office facilities. So I gave up my desk space with Mr. Pickering and established my own office. At first, I too rented desk space to others to reduce overhead expenses. By my agreement with the insurance companies I represented, I owned the business and would pay all expenses except the printing of the policies and the payment of the claims. Soon, I expanded my advertising to include national magazines, and inquiries came from states where Mr. Gilbert already had established exclusive agencies. So I wrote to him, mentioning these inquiries, and asked his advice. Harry Gilbert was a generous man, and he was pleased with the volume of business I was producing. He wanted to help. So he suggested that I write to E.C. Merhoff of the Commercial Casualty Insurance Company of Newark, New Jersey, with his recommendation. Here again I learned an important lesson. When you have a delicate problem because of the possibility of feelings being affected, Go directly to the person involved and ask him for advice in solving the problem. He is the one who can help you. As you listen, you'll see how this principle was used. My self-motivator for such a situation was, ask advice from the man who can help you. My letter to Mr. Merhoff brought the answer I wanted. He gave my agency, Combined Registry Company, exclusive rights in the entire United States to sell a special accent policy of my own design. I named it the Little Jank to symbolize a lot of protection for little cost. And ever since then, I've used that name for any similar policies. I continued to do business with Mr. Gilbert, and in some states I was running two sales organizations. More ads. More sales. More business. I had to multiply myself again. This time I needed sales managers in each state. 
The men for these positions were selected from my sales force, and our commissions were increased, so my percentage of profit on each unit sale was reduced. But I earned a larger net income from volume sales. Eventually, my organization was selling several hundred thousand policies a year. The sales managers were motivated to do their best. The more policies the salesmen under them sold, the more money the sales managers earned. Their overriding commissions were sufficiently high to warrant the investment of their time, effort, and money to build an organization in the states under their supervision. Thus, my time, effort, and money were saved. I decided to invest my time and effort to complete my high school education and to prepare for college. It was imperative to have a college degree to get into Harvard Law School, and that's what I was aiming for. It doesn't take much business experience to realize that it's common sense to continue to gain knowledge to become educated. I knew it was possible for me to make a fortune without a high school education. Many great Americans have, but from studying their biographies, I found that they continued to learn after they left school. Besides, there's more to life than making money. I've already said that I dropped out of high school in Detroit. My mother was on a business trip at the time, and one of my teachers and I had a disagreement concerning his capacity to evaluate my ideas. For some reason, he reported this to the principal, who called me to his office. He endeavored to prove that the time he spent talking to me cost the city of Detroit money, several hundred dollars per minute. Money, I thought to myself. Why, my earning capacity as a salesman is far greater than my teacher's. So instead of motivating me to do what he wanted, not argue with the teacher in the future, his logic caused a reverse reaction. I quit school. And if his logic was correct, Detroit saved thousands of dollars, for I never talked to the principal again. Perhaps at that time, I resented regimented authority as many high school kids do. Perhaps there are other reasons. There usually are. But I soon entered night school, the Detroit College of Law, and worked days. For I never, at any time, gave up the idea. Keep learning. The economy of the nation was growing rapidly as my national sales organization grew. My business was moving forward swiftly. Now I was in a position to go back to school, first night school, then day school at the YMCA. Upon graduating from the Y, I entered Northwestern University in Evanston, where I was living. My program, a full 18-hour course with classes in the morning, a swim, steam bath, half-hour nap, lunch at the Hamilton Club shortly after noon, a few hours at the office, then home. Everything was going along fine. It was quite a life, for then we were in the boom days. But after that came the crash and the Great Depression. People were starving, suffering, jobless, homeless. Fear crippled the nation, and the wealthy became poor almost overnight. Yet out of this disaster came individual and national strength. As the negative attitudes of people were changed to positive, Enlightenment, courage, appreciation of opportunities, the will to work, and most of all, the people returned to their churches for guidance. I didn't at first realize the impact of the market crash and the economic upheavals that followed, but I saw danger signals that motivated me to action. On La South Street in 1930, I'd often meet a friend someone I admired for his business success in the late 20s. After a friendly chat, just before shaking hands to say goodbye, he would ask, uh, By the way, Clem, uh, can you lend me $10 until Tuesday? I'd lend him the $10, but the Tuesday he was referring to never seemed to come. These experiences made me think. For although I had a sales system that never fails me, and I had complete confidence in my ability to meet any situation that might arise, I reasoned. Even the keenest minds in the nation lost fortunes when the market crashed. 
Who am I not to recognize us? It's time to build cash reserves for an emergency or be prepared to grasp a great opportunity should either arise. I wasn't what you would call the saving kind. I'd buy what I wanted, then work to pay for it. I'd increase my earnings by increasing sales, and I'd increase my personal sales by increasing my sales knowledge and skill. Every time I entered the Roanoke building, where I had my office, I was attracted by a sign in the window of the bank on the first floor, which seemed to verify this philosophy. It read, A young man can acquire a fortune if he obligates himself, for if he is honest, he will pay off his debts. I had obligated myself to purchase a home, two cars, and what I term necessities, and others might term luxuries, on time payments. Besides, I was always trying to expand my business, and the insurance companies I represented had each given me a sizable line of credit. So I forced myself to save by buying a 20-year endowment policy, the kind of life insurance that had the largest cash values. I bought a big one, big enough to make a loan of $20,000 nine years later, when both an emergency and opportunity presented itself. And I did this notwithstanding the fact that I had debts. I knew I'd pay them in full, for early in my experience, I've developed the self-motivator a deal's a deal, and a promise is a promise. Often during the Depression years, as many as 200 applicants would call up my office on a Monday morning for a personal interview in response to the ad in the Chicago Sunday Tribune. A line would start outside the office door in the Roanoke building and extend around the entire seventh-floor hallway. Experts may scoff, but I knew then, as I know now, that I had the ability to evaluate an individual rather accurately within a few minutes. For my selling experience made me sensitive to another person's reactions and enabled me to interpret them correctly. I developed a technique that enabled me to move rapidly to select those I wished to hire and to eliminate those I thought would not qualify without making them lose face. Here's what I did. One. Everyone was given the same literature that was sent to an applicant who applied through the mail. I didn't bother to take names and addresses of any applicant on the first interview. Two, is he a man of character? Is his attitude positive or negative? Is he willing to learn? These were the questions I asked myself. Three, if I didn't believe an applicant qualified, I tried to be as courteous and thoughtful of his feelings as possible. I'd say, in fairness, I plan to interview everyone. Here's the literature that explains the entire plan. If you're interested, return for a second interview. I knew that few would return because of the requirement of a cash deposit, but the applicant did save face. Four. Those men I wanted, I got. My procedure was exactly the same as with the applicants I wanted to eliminate, with this exception. I'd say, read the literature, and keep in mind that I'll prove to you by actual demonstration how easy it is for you to earn a large income. If the plan appeals to you, we'll get you licensed immediately. I'll do all the selling for a full day and turn the commissions over to you. Then I'd take a minute or two to tell him what large commissions I'd made on a salesman's basis the previous week. When an applicant was broke and a sales manager offered to do the work and turn the commissions over to him, he was willing to see what it was all about. Then when he received 30 to $50 in cash at the end of the first day, the opportunities were apparent. In those days, a dollar was a lot of money. I had pity and compassion for the has-beens. These were men who had made from $15,000 to $30,000 a year in boom days. But they became has either because they weren't willing to start at the bottom and climb back up, or because their attitudes were so negative that any job they might take would result in failure. Their futures were behind them, unless their employers knew the art of inspiration to action. I tell these experiences because I made a great discovery. 
I realized that I could train the salesmen I hired by taking them out to sell and demonstrating my sales system to them. In doing this, I began to get the knowledge to develop the know-how in perfecting a success system that never fails for training salesmen, something that I didn't have before. Realizing that my sales representatives needed to receive training, I began to send out a daily one-page sales bulletin. Each contained a successful sales rebuttal or a suggestion that I had personally found effective. You see, I was selling, and I was in selling trip. In the bulletins, I told the salesman what to say and how to say it. Thus, for example, the salesman would be instructed how to make the sale to a prospect who said, I don't have the money, even if it were necessary for the prospect to borrow the premium from his boss or a neighbor. In addition, each release contained an idea or self-motivator to inspire the salesman to action, such as, with every disadvantage, there is always a greater advantage. Writing this material helped me crystallize my thinking on paper. It was a step toward discovering my success system that never fails in training others. My problems were small in comparison to those of others who during the Depression maintained a negative mental attitude. But I did have problems. Telephone calls, letters, and interviews from my creditors became quite irritating. So one day I let my creditors know that they were going to get a 100 cents on the dollar plus 6% interest from the date of the obligation, they would receive payments in proportion to my earnings. Although this was a statement of my definite decision rather than a request for permission, no one complained. In due course, all were paid in full. By the end of 1939, all the parts of the treasure map had been found by me. 1. Inspiration to action at will. 2. Know-how to acquire wealth and success. 3. Knowledge of how to build a successful and profitable business. 4. And something more, a living philosophy. I knew I had brought together all the elements of my system, for I was put to a severe test in 1939, and I met the test successfully. I realized then, as I realize now, that to succeed in life you need to seek more than a definite major objective with singleness of purpose. To succeed, you must first seek the essence of many things. And these are the finer things of life. Now, the essence of anything is abstract. It is never found. It is never reached. Yet, if you search for the essence of perfection, you become more perfect. Search for the essence of success, and you become more successful. Search for the essence of achievement, and you achieve more. But in searching for the essence of anything, you also strive for specific major objectives, with singleness of purpose. And thus, with each successful step forward, you get closer and closer to the essence of that which you seek. And when you seek tangible riches, and success as you search for the true riches of life, you will find them, if this be your desire. The essence of success in any man's life depends on his living philosophy. The essence of a living philosophy is that it must be alive. To be alive, it must be lived. To be lived, you must act. Actions, not mere words, determine the validity of a man's living philosophy. For faith without works is dead. Whether he recognizes it or not, everyone has a philosophy. You become what you think. My living philosophy is this. First, God is always a good God. Second, truth will always be truth, regardless of lack of understanding, disbelief, or ignorance. Third, 
Man is a product of his heredity, environment, physical body, conscious and subconscious mind, experience, and particular position and direction in time and space, and something more, including powers known and unknown. He has the power to affect, use, control, or harmonize with all of them. Fourth, man was created in the image of God, and he has the God-given ability to direct his thoughts, control his emotions, and ordain his destiny. Fifth, Christianity is a dynamic, living, growing experience. Its universal principles are simple and enduring. For example, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, is simple in its concepts and enduring and universal in its application. But it must be applied to become alive. Six. I believe in prayer and the miraculous power of prayer. Now, what does this philosophy mean to me? It wouldn't mean a thing unless I lived it. To live it, I must apply it. Therefore, I shall give you an illustration of how I applied it in a time of need. Then, it may be more meaningful to you. In 1939, I owned an insurance agency that represented a large Eastern Accident and Health Insurance Company. Over a thousand full-time licensed agents were operating under my supervision in every state in the United States. My contract was verbal, and it provided for exclusive distribution of a specified series of accident policies. Under this working agreement, I own the business. The company printed the policies and paid the claims, and I assumed all other expense. It was spring. My family and I were vacationing in Florida when I received a letter from one of the top executive officers of the company. It stated briefly that my services would be terminated at the end of two weeks. My license to represent the company and the licenses of all my representatives would be canceled on that date. No policies could be sold or renewed after that date, and the president of the company was leaving on a trip and couldn't be reached for two months. I was faced with a serious problem. The type of contract I had just wasn't being made anymore. Making a new connection for a national operation such as mine within two weeks was an improbability and the families of the thousand representatives who worked for me would also have a problem if I didn't find a solution. Now, what do you do when you have a serious personal problem, a physical, mental, moral, spiritual, family, social, or business problem? What do you do when the walls begin to cave in? What do you do when there's no place to turn. That's the time to test your faith. For faith is mere daydreaming unless applied. True faith is applied continuously, but it is tested at the time of your greatest need. Now what would you have done if you had been faced with my problem? Here's what I did. I told no one but cloistered myself in my bedroom for 45 minutes. I reasoned. God is always a good God. Right is right. And with every disadvantage, there's a greater advantage, if one seeks and finds it. Then I knelt down and thanked God for my blessings. A healthy body, a healthy mind, a wonderful wife, three wonderful children, the privilege of living in this great land of freedom, this land of unlimited opportunity, and the joy of being alive. I prayed for guidance. I prayed for help. And I believed 
that I would receive them. And I got into positive mental action. On arising, I began to think. And I made four resolutions. One, I wouldn't be fired. Two, I would organize my own accident and health company, and by 1956, would have the largest in the United States. Three, I would reach another specific objective by 1956. This was of such magnitude and so personal that it would be improper to mention it here. Four, I would contact the president of the company, regardless of what part of the world he might be in. Then I got into physical action. I left the house and drove to the nearest public telephone booth to try to talk to the company president, for I didn't want my family to know the emergency with which I was faced. I succeeded because I tried. The president was a kindly, understanding man of principle. He gave me permission to continue operations upon my agreement to withdraw from the state of Texas, where the general agents of the company were having some competitive difficulties with my representatives. We were to meet at the home office in 90 days. We did meet in 90 days. I'm still licensed for that company, and I continue to give it business. When 1956 came, the company I organized in 1939 was not the largest accident health company in the United States, but it was the largest of its kind, the world's largest stock company writing accident and health insurance exclusively. My specific personal objective had also been achieved. Now what do you do when you have a serious personal problem, a physical, mental, moral, spiritual, family, social, or business problem? Your philosophy will determine your answer. Remember, the essence of a living philosophy is that it must be alive. To be alive, it must be lived. To be lived, you must act. Actions, not mere words, determine the validity of a man's living philosophy. There is an old Hindu legend stating that when the gods were making the world, they said, where can we hide the most valuable of treasures so that they will not be lost? How can we hide them so that the lust and greed of men will not steal or destroy them? What can we do to be assured that these riches will be carried on from generation to generation for the benefit of all mankind? So in their wisdom, they selected a hiding place that was so obvious it wouldn't be seen. And there they placed the true riches of life, endowed with the magic power of perpetual self-replenishment. In this hiding place, these treasures can be found by every living person in every land who follows the success system that never fails. And where is this hiding place? The most valuable of treasures are hidden within you. No one can steal or destroy them. You can't lose them. For the true riches of life are hidden in the hearts and minds of men. No matter what you want, you must start with yourself. Be it happiness, mental, moral, or physical health, love. The opportunity to be of service to your fellow men. Prestige. Position, wealth, the achievement of high goals, or success in any form. But there are natural barriers within you that can be overcome by you, if you know how. And here are some suggestions that will help you swing open the doors of those barriers. Little hinges that swing big doors. Engage in thinking, planning, and study time with regularity, especially on how to use your conscious mind to affect and use the powers of your subconscious. It would be helpful to do this daily. During your thinking time, try to recognize 
relate, assimilate, convert, and use the principles in this recording as your very own. This means that you follow through with action. Now that you've listened to this recording, write down a principle that you've heard and which you believe can be helpful to you. Then list the ideas on how you can specifically apply those principles. Each succeeding time that you listen to the success system that never fails, answer the following questions. What principle did I learn from the previous recording? What action did I take? Write down your answers. Then play the cassette once again, after which list a new principle and state the specific action you believe you will take. You can repeat these simple procedures each time with regularity. Keep a permanent notebook record so that you can check your progress. The three ingredients which are absolutely imperative for continuous success or achievement in any human activity are activity knowledge, know-how, inspiration to action. Activity knowledge is knowledge of the activity, service, product, methods, techniques, and skills with which you are particularly concerned. To gain activity knowledge, engage in thinking, planning, and study time with regularity. Learn how to use your conscious mind to affect the powers of your subconscious. Know how is the particular techniques and skills that consistently get results for you when applied. It is the proper application of knowledge. Know how becomes habit through actual repetitive experience. This means practice, 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 doing the right thing in the right way to get the right results. Inspiration to action is that which motivates you to act because you want to. With every disadvantage, there's a greater advantage for those who have a positive mental attitude, PMA. With every adversity, there's a seed of an equivalent or greater benefit for those who have PMA. Memorize, understand, comprehend, and apply those principles that will help you develop a positive mental attitude at will through the use of self-suggestions such as success is achieved and maintained by those who try and keep trying. Where there's nothing to lose by trying and a great deal of gain of successful, by all means try. Do it now. This is W. Clement Stone saying, I feel healthy, I feel happy, I feel terrific. How do you feel? Hi, this is W. Clement Stone saying, I feel healthy, I feel happy, I feel terrific, and you will too, when you follow the instructions in this recording. Because I believe you will, may I make an important prediction regarding you? Here it is. Something wonderful is going to happen to you. If you are ready, and if you are willing to listen, if you do listen, and if you are ready, you will react positively to this magic cassette tape message that was especially designed to inspire you to desirable action, mental and physical action that can bring into reality your dreams and desires and help you reach your objectives or goals if they don't violate the laws of God or the rights of your fellow men. This message has, in various written and verbal forms, influenced the lives of countless thousands who were ready and did listen. I implore you to therefore keep an open mind and listen. In the English language, no one word has a true synonym. Each has a different shade of meaning. 
To hear does not necessarily imply your attention or application, but to listen always does. And when I use the word symbol listen, it's my intent to motivate you to motivate yourself to desirable action, physical, mental, and emotional. Do listen. Listen for the ideas that are applicable to you. Yes, then something wonderful will happen and you will make it happen. Because results are what count, try to evaluate the worth of this cassette to you by your reactions to the message specifically, the positive, desirable action in the future that you would not have taken had you not listened to this recording. And what is the message? It's how to react to a self-help book and how to react to an inspirational cassette tape. You are listening to one now, and you can determine its worth to you by evaluating how it stimulates your thinking and activities in a desirable direction. At the age of 16, I, like many high school students, had problems. There were no books in the school library that told me how to solve them, or at least I didn't see them. But because I knew what I wanted, I recognized that which I believed would help me when I read an advertisement in one of the Chicago papers regarding a book, The Power of Will, by Frank Channing Haddock. I wanted willpower. I bought the book. It changed the course of my life, just as this message is intended to change the course of your life. What a thrill it is to recognize that you and I and every living person in every part of the world has one thing in common. So awesome that only God himself could create it, a brain and a nervous system. But in our educational institutions, we are not taught how to use the human computer from which the mechanical computer was designed. I'm referring to the powers of your subconscious mind and how you can tap them through the conscious, specifically as they pertain to the passions, emotions, instincts, tendencies, moods, formation and elimination of habits, and the aim high concept. I wanted to know how to use the power of my will and to understand the powers of my mind. This was one of my definite objectives. At age 16, I didn't realize it then, but I realized it later. To succeed, you must first know what you want. Do you know what you want? Is it good physical, mental, or moral health for yourself and your loved ones? Increased earnings? Wealth? Advancement in your career? To eliminate unhappiness? Have peace of mind? Just what do you want? You can have all of these and more, as long as they are non-conflicting. For what the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve for those who learn the art of motivation with PMA, a positive mental attitude. And this cassette teaches you how you can learn to develop the art of motivation and develop a positive mental attitude. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill has motivated more persons to motivate themselves to succeed in their careers and acquire wealth than any book written in the century. In Think and Grow Rich and the Laws of Success, as well as his other writings, he states in effect that definiteness of purpose is the first important ingredient to achievement. Other authors use the term singleness of purpose. Napoleon Hill illustrates by giving the major definite goals of men like Henry Ford, William Wrigley Jr., E.M. Statler, John D. Rockefeller, 
Thomas Edison, and a host of other successful persons. Keep in mind that when you consciously know specifically what you want, you are more apt to recognize that which will help you achieve it. Important. After listening to this cassette, and each time you replay this recording, be certain to first engage in study, thinking, and planning time. When you do, write down or review your definite major objectives or goals, distant, intermediate, and short term. But aim high. Now everyone has problems, and you're no exception. Therefore, whether you recognize it or not, you subconsciously would like to eliminate undesirable personal, family, or business difficulties. Therefore, during your thinking time, consciously determine specific potential goals to bring about a solution to your problems. In seeking a solution, write down a goal that would likely bring about that which you desire. It should be made in a positive statement rather than a negative. A teenager who is tempted by his peers to do wrong could decide to adopt the self-suggestion, which is a self-motivator, have the courage to say no. This really works. Your difficulties could become a blessing in disguise. For with every adversity, there are often the seeds of equivalent or greater benefits for those who engage in study, thinking, and planning time with regularity and employ the art of motivation with PMA. The principles to successfully solve your disappointments, difficulties, and problems are exactly the same as those necessary to reach your long-term major objectives as well as those that are intermediate or short-term. I'll discuss suggestion and self-suggestion later. While each of the achievers that Dr. Hill refers to kept in mind his definite major purpose, this did not prevent him from reaching many goals that did not conflict with it. Countless thousands of persons achieve success in reaching their goals who have studied inspirational self-help action books or listened to inspirational cassettes. I know from experience. Because of so many thousands of testimonials I have received and the first-hand information by observing how the lives of so many thousands have been changed for the better. After reading the magnificent Obsession by Lloyd C. Douglas, I determined my magnificent obsession in life would be to try to change this world and make it a better world in which to live for this and future generations. I was motivated to do the Lord's work on earth by sharing the blessings I received, which were far beyond what any man could expect or deserve. achiever must pay to succeed, and that is to engage in study, thinking, and planning time with regularity. Studying an inspirational self-help book or the message in an inspirational tape, and then follow through with action. It isn't necessary to study or think when you read a book or hear a cassette tape. But it is imperative 
that you engage in study, thinking, and planning time to understand, comprehend, and learn when you read a self-help book or hear an inspirational cassette message if you are going to apply the principles they contain into your own life. And this cassette message will now offer you specific ideas on how you can establish and maintain the habit of doing this. I'll illustrate with a story on how a company solved management problems in its efforts to increase its sales, gross and net profits by helping its employees, sales representatives, and officers achieve their personal goals and solve their personal problems. In solving their personal problems, they automatically help their company achieve its objectives in every phase of its operations. The company I'm referring to is Combined Insurance Company of America. We have achieved that which no other company has been able to accomplish. We've made history in the insurance business, primarily because I have shared with all of our people that which I am, in essence, sharing with you now. How to react to a self-help book and how to react to an inspirational cassette tape. I encouraged him to come out of retirement and devote five years to the completion of his life's work. He agreed on one condition. He said, I'll do it only if you become my general manager. After much thought, I agreed, notwithstanding that I was busy building up my insurance enterprises. I reasoned. It's no longer true that if you build the best mousetrap or offer the best product or service, that a path will be beaten to your door. Today, it is necessary to merchandise and sell. I am a salesman by vocation. It's very seldom that an individual can change the course of history during his lifetime and make his world a better world for this and future generations. Through the philosophy of American achievement, as Napoleon Hill and Andrew Carnegie, the great steelmaker, philanthropist, and philosopher, called it, I could readily see that this opportunity would be of help to me in reaching my definite major life's goal. And I found the validity of a principle in the Magnificent Obsession, specifically. When you try to do good for others without accepting compensation or recognition, it comes back 10,000-fold. Previous to the time Napoleon Hill and I co-authored Success to a Positive Mental Attitude, Dr. Hill felt that definiteness of purpose was the starting point for all success. I felt that PMA was the one ingredient that was absolutely imperative to precede the other 16 principles Andrew Carnegie and Napoleon Hill discussed when Napoleon Hill, as a young writer, in 1908 interviewed him. We both were satisfied when on page 17 of Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude, number one of the 17 principles was listed as a positive mental attitude, and number two, definiteness of purpose. And then, on page 23, we wrote, definiteness of purpose combined with PMA is the starting point of all worthwhile achievement. A positive mental attitude, PMA, is the right attitude in a given environment or situation. In America, we know what the right attitude is by virtue of our inherited customs and laws that are based on the tenets of the Judeo-Christian faiths. A good illustration would be the essence of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you, and equally important, don't do unto others what you wouldn't want others to do unto you, whether or not they are aware of what you say or do regarding them. Now, throughout this message, I've used strong, positive verbal suggestions. Suggestion is communications to the subconscious mind through the five senses, 
are internal from the subconscious to the conscious and back to the subconscious, such as a passion, emotion, instinct, tendency, mood, idea, or habit. Verbal self-suggestion is deliberately memorizing a word, phrase, poem, platitude, or any saying by repeating it so frequently that it is imprinted indelibly in your subconscious mind in order that it will flash to your conscious mind in time of need. In brief, one, suggestion is stimulated from the outside. In other words, your environment. Two, self-suggestion is purposely controlled from within the individual and becomes automatic. Three, auto-suggestion acts by itself when self-suggestion becomes automatic and consciously like a machine that reacts in the same way from the same stimulus. And now the following from Success to a Positive Mental Attitude contains a thought provocative concept that will help those who pay the price to understand and comprehend its meaning. You are the most important living person as far as you and your own life are concerned. You are the product of your heredity, environment, physical body, conscious and subconscious mind, experience, and particular position and direction in time and space, and something more, including powers known and unknown. For you are a mind with a body, and your mind consists of dual, invisible, gigantic powers, the conscious and the subconscious. One is a giant that never sleeps. It is called the subconscious mind. The other is a giant which, when asleep, is powerless. When awakened, his potential power is unlimited. This giant is known as the conscious mind. When the two work in harmony, they can affect, use, control, harmonize, and neutralize with all known and unknown powers. A self-motivator is the use of self-suggestion to condition your mind to act positively when it flashes to your conscious mind in time of need. The following have proved helpful to those who have taken the time to memorize them. What the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve for those who have PMA. With every adversity, there is a seed of an equivalent or greater benefit for those who have PMA. Success is achieved and maintained by those who try and keep trying with PMA. Man's greatest power lies in the power of prayer. Do it now. To memorize a self-motivator, I recommend that you try to memorize only one at a time. It pays to write it out several times. It also would be helpful to repeat it with enthusiasm 40 or 50 times in the morning and in the evening and sometime throughout the day for a week or so in order that the self-motivator is impressed indelibly into your subconscious. You, of course, can develop your own self-motivators. You will recall that I said I made a great discovery for me in 1937 when I found that I could use self-help books and subsequently inspirational tapes to motivate combined representatives and office personnel to high achievement through the art of motivation with PMA. In the prosperity of the early 70s, Many individuals were outstandingly successful, and they still are. But there are many among our sales representatives, employees, and managers who lost or didn't acquire the art of motivation with PMA. We had a problem, a serious problem. But fortunately, we employed the self-motivator 
enumerated by the famous team of Borden and Bussey at a sales executive seminar I attended many years ago. It is, you don't always get what you expect unless you inspect. Here is a truism that is applicable to those in management as well as to you and me and every person who makes resolutions or has definite goals. Real progress was made among our office personnel. We installed an employee self-development program on company time. In the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Frank Betcher's How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling, Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude, and The Success System That Never Fails, the authors give a set of instructions that when followed, will guarantee you success in achieving your goals by an effective method of daily inspection. Remember, there's a price to pay to succeed. You must engage in study, thinking, and planning time with regularity. Benjamin Franklin wanted to acquire certain virtues. He decided on 13 and made a little book and allotted a page for each. He concentrated on just one each day for an entire week. Each following week, he would concentrate on another. Thus, he would have completed the series in 13 weeks. He would then repeat and cover the series four times within a year. At the top of each page, he would have a self-motivator that was meaningful to him. Frank Batcher was a miserable failure in the life insurance business until he recognized, related, assimilated, and applied the Franklin Principle. He developed 13 cards. The first was titled Enthusiasm. The self-motivator was to be enthusiastic, act enthusiastic. All those persons I know who followed the Benjamin Franklin Principle of daily inspection have been successful in achieving their objectives. Many individuals never start. Perhaps it's because it is difficult for them to list 13 personal characteristics they would like to achieve. And that's why I recommend that you start with just one and check each day as to the progress you are making. Sometime during the week, you will decide on the second personal characteristic you wish to develop, and if you will do this week by week, you will cover your 13 with ease. It's necessary to inspect, to be certain that you get what you expect when you desire to change your personality from negative characteristics to positive, such as Benjamin Franklin and Frank Betcher did. It is also desirable that you write down your long-term definite major goal in life and review this daily to see what progress you are making. Your ability to recognize, relate, assimilate, and use the PMA principles is the power that will open any door, meet any challenge, overcome any obstacle, and help you to achieve success, wealth, and happiness. Self-help literature is comprised of fundamental principles that have stood the test of time. A principle is a basic truth, a universal law that does not change. For example, a physics principle is that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The R2A2 formula, like any formula, is made up of individual parts. Let's analyze each ingredient. R, recognize, is to identify the principle, idea, or technique. R, relate, is to connect or join together to establish a relationship. A, assimilate, is to make similar or alike, to incorporate, to absorb, to become a part of. A, action, is to denote use, follow through, doing. Now, each ingredient of the formula is important and has special meaning. But when combined, they form a formula for your success. By using this formula, you'll be able to focus the spotlight 
on the success principles that have directed and guided W. Clement Stone and other successful men in achieving their objectives. The same principles can and will help you achieve success. Develop your own success reflex. Let's take another approach to the R2A2 formula, one that will make it even clearer and more applicable. First of all, we need a success reflex, a trigger phrase that will immediately direct your mind when you recognize a success principle. Recognize or that's for me. I recognize the principle that is being used. It helps someone else. I can see the results. It will work for me. If I use it, that's for me. Relate. Or what does it mean to me? What will the success principles do for me? Important. You must relate the principles to yourself. Start with the most important living person, as far as you are concerned. You. Assimilate. Or how can I use the principle to achieve my goals? How can I absorb the principles into my behavior so that they become a part of me? How can I develop a success habit, a success reflex so that the right thing will be done? Action or when am I going to use it? When am I going to start? Ask yourself these important questions and then follow through with the self-starter, do it now. Yes, do it now. The R2A2 formula should become so ingrained in your mind that you can recognize success principles from listening to an inspiring tape, sermon, lecture, or advice, or from what you hear, and from reading a newspaper or magazine article, from reading a self-help book, by studying the lives of great men and many other sources. Remember, develop and use your own reflex. That's for me. And now, additional helpful hints for reading a self-help book are listening to an inspirational cassette tape. There's an art to reading a self-help book. When you read, concentrate. Read as if the author were a close personal friend and was writing to you and you alone. Also, it is wise to know what you're looking for. For if you really want to relate and assimilate into your own life, the ideas that are contained between the covers of an inspirational book, work at it. A self-help book is not to be skimmed through the same way that you might read a detective novel. These principles are applicable in listening to inspirational cassettes, sermons, lectures, or what you read in an inspiring story, magazine, or newspaper article. Dr. Billy Sharp authored choose success. He wrote, in a novel, the author usually controls the conclusion. In a self-help book, the reader writes the conclusion. This means action on your part. I say this is terrific, Dr. Sharp continues. Since ideas come from unexpected places, it is important to read with a notepad at hand. Anything of interest? A flash of inspiration? or an answer to a problem, should be jotted down immediately. The reader should read asking the question, what does this mean to me? The reader will want to be alert for the how-tos. A good self-help book will have how-to information as well as what to. Be alert for both and the relationship between the two, unquote. I have recommended to my representatives that they do that which I have found helpful to me when reading an inspirational self-help action book. Read the dedication beginning with the first page, index, and each page in sequence. Read the entire book. If you own the book, underscore that which you feel is important, especially what you would like to memorize. Put a question mark next to a statement you don't understand or you question. You can even write short notes in the margins of a page. Write on your notepad 
any inspiring ideas or potential solutions to any problem that flashes into your mind. As the chapters are generally short, complete a chapter before you stop reading. The value of reading the entire book is to get the feel of the entire philosophy it contains, as well as your emotional reaction. An author in this field is instructed to keep the reader reading. After you've completed your first reading, read it again for the purpose of studying, so that you understand and comprehend the information in each paragraph. Memorize self-motivators. Again, underscore additional words and phrases that are important to you. In a self-help book, it's seldom necessary to use a dictionary, as these books are generally written in modern language that a teenager can understand. But every so often, the author will write a paragraph or two in an editorial fashion, and if there is a word, the meaning of which you don't understand, look it up in a dictionary and be certain to check its synonyms. It's helpful in the third reading to merely go over the material you underscored as well as memorize additional self-motivators that appeal to you. Sometime later, reread the book. I remember a time when Napoleon Hill had a problem and seemed unable to come up with an answer. So he read his own book, Think and Grow Rich, and found the answer to his problem. Warning. Don't be like the editors in a publishing company who must read self-help books from an editorial viewpoint, but don't recognize, relate, assimilate, and apply the principles that could change the course of their lives for the better. And don't be like the chef's assistant at a restaurant in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I've thought of him many times. For months, in opening oysters, he looked for pearls, but didn't find one. Senator W. Russell Arrington, his wife Ruth, Mrs. Stone and I, had a lovely dinner at that same restaurant. The senator ordered six oysters and found one of the most beautiful pearls I've ever seen. There are pearls in a self-help book and in inspirational cassettes. Keep looking for them. Find them. In this recording, you've been told how to react to an inspirational cassette tape in a self-help book. Now it's your opportunity to eagerly listen to the message that was especially designed to inspire you to desirable action. If you do, something wonderful is going to happen to you. You will make it happen. This is W. Clement Stone saying, I feel healthy. I feel happy. I feel terrific. You will too when you follow the instructions in this magic cassette.